Good morning again. And we may have some folks from our general community, not just Master Gardeners, and welcome to all of you. This is a series of advanced education talks that we have planned throughout the year. So do keep us on your calendar because we have a, a, a fine lineup for the rest of the year. This morning, we're gonna be looking at agrivoltaics and it's the use, of, it's the dual use of agricultural land by way of uh, ground mounted solar arrays above crops, grasses for grazing and native plants. Mike, the presentation will include a report from the first solar farm summit that took place last year and a review of Douglas County's forward thinking as well as agrivoltaics enabling zoning changes. Future trends will also be discussed. And that's going to be by Brent Rakesdale. He's a mechanical engineer, and he aspires to addressing Earth's ecological crisis and to minimize humanity's biophysical impacts. And that is through energy transition and the use of less resources in general. And that's something that we all uh, support. He and his wife, Patty, live in a passive house. Um, it, it's a passive solar house, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, so they, they live the message as well as preach it. Uh, and they're on a small farm in Tonganoxie. Uh, they run a nonprofit called Botanical Belonging, and it's a way of sharing the love of local native plants with the greater Kansas City community, and that also includes Douglas County. Brent is a host of Eco Radio KC. It's a weekly magazine on 90.1 KKFI, exploring in the interdependence our interdependence with the rest of the world. So I'll pass the mic over, Brent. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Lily. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. That, that good? All right. Good well, it's nice to be here. I appreciate well, the Twenty-five percent is not going to work for a whole hour. I'm it impressed is. with how how many people you have here for your fair. Sorry. Um, any other cords either. All my cords are the same. So uh, this is what I'm going to be covering everything today. I've ever uh, had used I just want to do a, a little quick uh, bit about me and, and uh, oh, you can plug how I came to uh, you're talking to you about agriculture. No, I can't. So um, mine is too small. No, but yours is smaller than that. Yeah. Really? Wow. Sorry about this, but okay. So um, I want to share some of the basics about agrivoltaics. Um, I I went to a as as Larry said, I went to a solar uh, farm summit, which was the first uh, North American Expo on this subject, and um, I I want to give you a sense of you know, where we are in the United States and also in the world with agrivoltaics and, and, and also, you know, how we're here in Kansas, we're a little bit lagging. Um, uh, finally, I want to, <laughs> surprise, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I, I am gonna talk quite a bit about, uh, I'll go through kind of an agrivoltaics 101. I've got a really great website that I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean on for, for showing you that. And then I want to get into sort of where we are with agrivoltaics in Kansas and then specifically here in Douglas County. I know several of you have already come up and talked to me rather passionately about the, the, the new Kansas Sky Energy Center proposal. So we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll give you a few of my opinions at the end, kind of light on that. And if we don't have you know, enough time, I, I may skip that so that we make sure we have enough time for discussion and uh, questions. So that's where we're headed here. So, oh. Um, I guess my 
my picture has to be somewhere. Introduction. So someone from your group uh, advertised this talk out on your on your Facebook page, and they found this very nice pragmatic uh, definition of agrivoltaics um, from the Department of Agriculture and this nice picture of some agrivoltaics. So I thought I would include this, you know, that the, the Department of Ag, um, you know, instead of seeing the use of, of land as a competing thing, you know, either for food or for energy, they say, they think, hey, you know, agrivoltaics could be a, a, an and instead of an or, which I think is really, you know, the brilliant idea that we need to get our heads around. So um, a, a little bit about me, you know, I, I am an engineer from that other school up the river. Um, <laughs> I am a host on Eco Radio. Terry Wilkie, our producer, is here. So Terry, if this is any good, I may excerpt some of this for a, for a future show. As Larry said, um, my wife Patty and I are, um, uh, we, we run a not-for-profit called Botanical Belonging. We've got a 10-acre farm. Um, sort of between Tonganoxy and Bonner Springs. Um, I think several of you have been there. We sell native plants on Saturdays. So I think a lot of you have been there actually. And a few years ago, Patty gave a talk to your group that was in the old depot. And I remember that there were lots of trains that went by. So <laughs> now that we're in the Zoom age, I think this is a better venue probably for technology. And then speaking of technology, I am going to give the group a PDF file of my presentation. And so you'll have all of these links and there are quite a few hot links. So these three in red are all hot linked and would take you to our different websites. So in addition to Eco Radio, um, I wanna give a little bit of more plug about Eco Radio. So, um, You know, uh, Eco Radio is, is basically what we call a, a locally made exploration of positive solutions for today's environmental challenges. And, um, you know, after this talk, I, I, after going through all of the preparation for this talk, I, I do want to make sure that we um, use some of that for the radio as well. Um, Patty and I also are volunteers for the Casey Farm School in Kansas City, Kansas. So Casey Farm School um, has a great mission. It's to um, bring individuals of all ages, ancestries, and abilities on farm, on hands, to connect to the land, soil, food, community, and opportunity. And I am a real believer, you know, in the in teaching people how to grow their own food. And I really appreciate groups like the Master Gardeners you know, that are spreading the knowledge of how to cultivate beauty, biodiversity, and food production. So good, good on you for doing that. Okay, so um, I, I did a bit of a deep dive about a year ago into agrivoltaics. And I put deep dive in, in italics because it's a deep dive for me. You know, I think there may be people here who know more about it than, than I do, but I'm, kind of a generalist. And so I tend to know a little bit about a lot. And so that's what I would say I, I know about agrivoltaics as well. But at the time, a year ago, I was working for an energy company and we had a project in Atchison where the customer was looking to put in a solar array that was going to be in a, a meadow that had always been hay. And I was really concerned about the impact that was gonna, gonna have and, and really, wanting to know what the options were around agrivoltaics, you know, to make the least amount of impact. And so I started looking online and I quickly came up with this um, agrivoltaics clearinghouse, which is kind of a repository of great information. They have a lot of webinars that I watched. And then I found out that there was going to be this first annual um, expo that they called the, the Solar Farm Summit. And so I asked my employer and they didn't want to pay for it. But, um, you know, Patty and I with Botanical Belonging have, have interest in doing a demonstration of agrivoltaics. And so does the farm school. And so I decided to attend on my own dime on my way to visit my folks in Seattle. So last March, I went to this. It was a three-day 
event. I would say that it was really a success. Um, this year, they're going to do it again, but they're going to have some competition. There's also a world conference, and that's going to be in Denver in June. So I'm not sure if I'm going to go to that or not. I think it would be very interesting to attend. So a little bit about the Farm Summit. Um, I think it was a big success. They had more people than they expected the first day the food at the buffet was just gone. because. <laughs> So you learn, get there early. Um, Nick, they, they, they reacted that from then on, they fed us pretty well. But, you know, there were quite a few government people there. There, there were, of course, this clearinghouse and the, the organizations that kind of put it together. Um, you can tell from their logo that they were big into sheep grazing, you know, and, and that uh, there, there's a group that I'm going to talk a little bit more about called the American Solar Grazing Association that has a lot of great information. Mostly the government agencies that seemed to be funding this, these studies and were from the Department of Energy, but there was a little bit from the EPA and uh, not too much. I think there were some people in attendance from the Ag Department, but they didn't do any of the speaking. There were people from national labs, some, some institutes, half a dozen colleges, including one professor from K-State. He was the only other person from Kansas that I met while I was there. And... Um, in addition to it being, you know, a, a conference where they had presentations and panel discussions in multiple rooms, it was also a trade show. So they had a lot of equipment manufacturers and people that were selling services and a lot of things around native plants and um, beekeeping and, you know, all manner of garden tools and all things that you guys would be find interesting. So. Um, so some of the findings that I had in my, in my dive into agrivoltaics and in this uh, solar farm, farm summit, um, I came across a group online that's, that's funded by, by NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab, and they're you know, funded by the Department of Energy. And it's called INSPIRE, sort of an eye chart here, but that stands for Innovative solar practice integrated with rural economics and ecosystems. Okay. Inspire, there you go. Okay, so they have, you know, databases and maps, and, and I have three maps that I found online. The, the two on the left are from that Inspire group. So the, the furthest left shows the research sites. And yeah, that kind of looks like there's something happening in Kansas, but really that's just pointing to the stuff that's over in Colorado in the state's <laughs> west. And the, the middle one shows all of the agrivoltaics that they had on their database. The only one mentioned from Kansas is, is in South Hutchison, where they have 10 acres and they're growing alfalfa underneath the panels. So that's all that's going on, even though we've got all of this potential for, for solar here in, in the state. And then the, the one on the right is from this American Solar Grazing Association. Again, these are hot links, so that would the, the PDF that will take you to their site. You can see the, the things in, in green there are the, the, the agrivoltaic sites that are doing grazing. And you can see that that's really the, the majority of what they're, what they're doing. So I had a, you know, a couple of takeaways from, from this that were kind of stuck with me. So the first is that of the, of the three kinds of agriculture that they're really looking at to pair with agrivoltaics, or, or I should say use of the land. Grazing is one, crop production is the other, and then what they call ecological services, which is basically growing native plants, things to enhance the biosphere um, and the biodiversity. Of those, the grazing is the biggest thing. Um, the other takeaway is that, you know, there's a lot happening in the rest of the country, but not here, and there really should be. So I've already made that point. Um, one of the speakers and a person that I met at this, um, and Kevin said that he's a, familiar with this group, is a guy named Byron Kominik. And here's a picture of, of him and his wife. I like that because he's 6'5", and Patty is short too, so he and I are kind of similar to that. Um, they have a farm. It's on his family farm that's in Longmont, um, which is in Colorado, you know, just in the snow shadow of the Rockies, north of, of Denver, about uh, 30 miles. 
And they have converted this to an agrivoltaics um, operation. And he is a bit of a, I would say an ambassador for agrivoltaics as well. So in addition to running this farm, they, he also um, has a, a not-for-profit that's called the Colorado Agrivoltaics Learning Center. And part of their mission is to help work with um, the different counties in the country to try to get the legislation so that you can do multi-use you know, things out in the rural spaces. So it doesn't have to be just zoned for agriculture but, or for energy production, but there could be some sensible zoning that could be for both. And he was consulted with by Douglas County and came and talked uh, maybe by Zoom um, and gave you know some good information as we developed our new ordinances. And I like this guy a lot. And I, if I do end up doing an eco radio show, I might you know interview him for thirty or for fifteen minutes of our of our show. Um, so I'm going to try to show you some things um, from his website. That's the the learning center. This at this. Uh, Agrivoltaics 101. So I'm going to try to get over here to. Yeah. So this is their website and a lot of good information. Again, you know, Agrivoltaics, Solar Panels Plus Agriculture, a very nice little brochure that you could download. I really like his definition of the problem. And I, I know this might be a little small, so let me read this to you. Most solar installations are developed with single seed turf or bare ground beneath the panels. The grass seed is inexpensive and can be easily managed by application of pesticides and occasional mowing. This type of vegetation management under panels can lead to decreased water retention, less soil stability, reduced carbon sequestration, and loss of habitat for, for pollinators, birds, and wildlife. And I think that really captures the problem pretty well. Um, so the solution, there's an alternative to turf and bare ground under solar panels. The co-location of solar and beneficial agriculture is re referred to as agrivoltaics. So that, that's it. And then he's got you know these basic three kinds, grazing, crop production, and um, pollinators. So, um, Again, his focus has been on crop production. And I think it's one of the few places that you can go and tour and really see some, some, some really great stuff. So uh, this schematic that sort of shows the different kinds of setups for arrays, at, along the top, he's calling that the traditional utility scale configuration. And that's what is being proposed for North of Lawrence. So that is what you would call a single axis tracker. So these are long rows mounted north and south, and they just tilt in one direction. So in the morning time, they would be faced towards the east and to capture the rising sun, and then during the day, they just follow the sun. And so that's more efficient in terms of the power that you can generate in, per area of the panel than, say, a fixed tilt mount that's just faced towards the south. So um, there are some other configurations, greenhouses, you know, there, I read an interesting article that in California, they're also looking at agrivoltaics with just vertically mounted like little walls of, of solar panels that are called bifacial. So they actually take the sun from both sides. There'd be advantages there where you could run your tractors and combines between those rows. There would also be advantages because it would have more production in the morning and in the evening, maybe in the afternoon when they have an abundance of solar power in California, you don't need as much. So that, that might be a good alternative as we start filling out and really managing our grid. <clears throat> okay, uh, some of the advantages uh, that, that Byron on his website has talked about for agrivoltaics, water conservation, higher yields, you know, some synergy between the crops and the agrivoltaics in terms of how much water um, is lost due to evaporation and, and things like that. Increased habitat, improving the soil. I think the improving the soil is a big thing. You know, I think if we're gonna do this across the country, we really need to look at ways that we can increase the, the soil or the carbon in the soil to help also the global warming problems. 
So, okay, I'm going to switch out of this and well, actually, no, I'm going to come back down here and how do I get to my other tab? Ah, here I, I see. I also want to show you this. Figure it out. My Can you help me get to this tab, Kevin? You may have to move that control bar. Oh, I was on, I was clicking too low. There we go. Great. That full screen. So, Jack Sullivan, the space between rows of solar panels divided into three soft ends, each with a different light. So, A gets morning sun and afternoon shade. The plants that prefer cooler temperatures and more shade in hot climates grow well in this environment. Row B receives the most sunlight throughout the middle of the day. Sun loving plants thrive there. Row C gets morning shade and afternoon sun when temperatures are higher. This is where the push of heat tolerance plants. Solar panels also alter the soil moisture by redirecting summer rains and morning dews. Keeping the moisture content in the topsoil highest in rows A and C, while row B exhibits similar levels to open land. The shade from solar panels slows the evaporation rate of moisture from the soil, meaning that less irrigation is needed for crops, preserving our precious water resources. Single axis tracking panels cycle sun and shade over the plants, reducing their heat and water stresses. At the same time, the plants release moisture from their leaves cooling the panels and enabling them to work more efficient. When we pair solar panels with the right plants, both enjoy a cooler environment and higher production. This is agrivoltaics. Isn't that great? Yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah, so Patty and I really want to go out and visit this, this couple and, and see that. Uh, what am I doing? <laughs> Which one was it? Oh, I see it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to give you this advertisement. I can share what they say. <laughs> Metabolism killer. Metabolism <laughs> killer. That could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so jack solar garden it, i want to point out a couple things before we move on from this slide first off the the mechanism is basically the same as as the kansas sky you know it's these what they're calling piles which are basically high beams that are galvanized the difference is that at jack solar garden they put them higher, you know? So he has two different heights, one that's about five feet and one that's about eight feet. So this picture on the lower left, you know, in the evening time, they can put the, the panels, you know, flat and they've got the little Edison lights under there to make a, you know, ephemeral venue for a concert or also a wedding. You know, I think it's really, really neat. The other thing, if you go and watch more of their videos, the farmers really like working in the shade, which I'm, I'm sure your group would really appreciate. So, so that other picture, you know, shows that as well. So a, a couple of things I wanted to point out. The other is the spacing between the rows. Um, I called Byron to get his permission to share all this information, and he was fine with that. And he told me that that spacing is 17 feet on center. Uh, digging through the information, it's going to be similar for the, for the Kansas uh, sky project as well. Okay, better move on. So let's talk a little bit about the state of solar in Kansas right now. So not to pick on my home county of Leavenworth, but this is one of the closer utility scale arrays. This is just northeast of Tonganoxy. So if you're going on that diagonal road that goes towards Leavenworth, it's just a couple miles out of town on the left-hand side. Um, this has been put in by a, a electric power cooperative called Free State, which I think they're doing good stuff. It, it's part of a, of a program called the Kansas 
Cooperative Sun Program. Their intent is to have 22 such sites around the state of Kansas. They're going to be pretty similar to this one, which is typical, which is a, a producing one megawatt and it's on about 10 acres, so about 3,500 panels. But if you look at this, and maybe I'll move my picture of me out of the way, you can, it's a little dark, but you can see that it's a similar, you know, setup. It's the same galvanized steel I-beam stuck down into the ground, but it's a little bit lower to the ground. But, you know, all they're doing is just, you know, it's exactly what Byron talked about it as the problem, you know, and, and little things add up. So if you do 10 acres 22 times, that's 220 acres that we're going to be converting to this you know, and probably they're not going to want to mow it, so they're just going to spray Roundup on it. You know, it's just going to be dirt that nothing's going to live there. So that's a shame when it could be productive land for something else. So that's my point. All right. Um, this might be a bit of a shock, this picture. Um, it was for me. So they, I, I, I visited with the Kansas Sky folks this week. I set up an appointment. They were really nice. They gave me five copies of their brochures. They've got a great website. Probably some of you have been out there to look at their website. You can download the, the brochures. You can download um, Douglas County's ordinance. You can download their grazing plan, their vegetation plan, all kinds of stuff. But one of the things that's in this packet is just a, a one-page flyer about the project. So, um, of course, I've got two of the same things. But, oh, they're here. Um, on the back of it, there is um, a picture of the, the site. So what I did, I just took that. I was curious, how big would that be compared to the city of Lawrence? So out on Google Earth, I, I took this in with my ancient version of Photoshop and my meager skills from working at Hallmark for many years and um, superimposed this on. So, I, you know, disclaimer, it, it's not super accurate. You know, I could be off by five or 10% in terms of size, scale, or placement, but I think I'm probably closer than that, actually. So the project is slated to be 159 megawatts, you know, compared to the one megawatt out in, in Tonganoxie. And it's going to be 100, no, 1,103 acres. So the ordinance was actually for a up to a thousand acres. And I thought, wow, that sounds like a lot. Well, a thousand acres is actually a little bit more than a mile and a half square. And so in terms of like how big that is in, in the city, a mile and a half would be this green square, which is basically going from Iowa to Mass from 23rd to 13th Street. That's a huge area that we're talking about. So, you know, I know there's a lot of supporters for this, but just know that this is this is a big, substantial thing that we're that we're doing here. So, you know, if, let's talk a bit about the placement. You know, the reason that that Evergy and and the energy company, uh, what's it called, Savion? Thank you, Savion Energy. The reason they want to put it there, it it's it's right across the river from the coal-fired plant that we've all wanted to to, to be closed for years and years. You know, and um. So there's real advantages to putting it there in terms of the grid infrastructure, the substations, and just the, the, the management of power on the grid. You want it to be where you already, you know, are displacing some power. So Evergy, I don't know if you've heard, but their latest plan is to, is to not close that plant, but to convert it from burning coal to burning natural gas, you know, what the rest of the world calls methane or methane. Um, it's a cleaner burning fuel, but you know when you burn a hydrocarbon, it still makes carbon dioxide and it still contributes. But the, the thing about the peaker plants, they can be turned on and off and only need to run during the peak demand, which since, since the Kansas Sky Energy Project does not include any batteries, that you really need to be able to do that. You know, when, when it's producing power, yeah, that can go into the system. But when it, when it isn't, you may need to turn the, the peaker on. That's kind of a pragmatic approach. Another reason they want to put it right there, it's it's bottom land that's not rocky. And so those piers go down like six or eight feet and you can just drive them in with a machine and you don't have to drill a hole and then cement them in. So 
it's much cheaper to do it that way. So that, you know, those are really the two reasons why they would want to do it there. So, um, again, their plan, which um, you can go out and read about, is basically to do all thousand acres with um, sheep grazing. And I think that's, <clears throat> that's possible. And I think that we could use the, the sheep here for a lot of things. I don't know. You guys are meat eaters, but you know there are a couple of my favorite restaurants on Massachusetts. You know you can you can get a, a lamb dinner there. You know, and I think there's a potential to do more of that. Um, but um, I don't know much about sheep. You know, admittedly, so I'm I'm really out of school on this. One of my buddies from K State, I called him, and, you know, and was telling him about how how much space they were saying off the ground. And he thought, oh, I'm not sure this sheep could get under there. But according to this, um, you know, American Sheep Grazing Association, they're nimble, they can get, you know, up under there where people can't. And so even though the, what, what they, what the people from the Kansas Sky, you know, office here in, in Lawrence told me was that the, at, at the minimum height, when they're at the maximum angle, you know, tilt angle, it's only going to be like 18 to 24 inches off the ground, which would then be similar to what we saw from the, the Free State site. But, um, you know, they, the, the, it sounds like that's not going to be a problem for the sheep to get under. Um, the, the distances that, that um, if you go out and look at the, at the downloadable plans, they they say that the on center distance is 21.3 feet. Jack Solar Garden was 17 feet, so similar. Just measuring it off of Google Maps, the, the other one by Tonganoxi was 19 feet. So I think that's pretty similar. So, you know, that's really the plan. Um, I would encourage people that do know about sheep or do or really want to know about the the kinds of, of things they're going to plant to feed these, you know. Creatures, uh, you really dig into and look at, at this because I think it's it's important. So Evergy also intends to offer some grants for uh, three different groups. They want to give access to fifty acres for agrivoltaics research, which I think is really a great idea. I would love to see, you know, that more happen around the other types of agricultural, you know, things. In, um, so a little bit more about that when we get into my uh, my uh, opinions at the back. Um, so some of the names that they talked about when I met with these two folks were, you know, KU and K-State, the agronomy departments and, and others. Uh, mm -hmm. The Land Institute, they've reached out to them. Could they, could they grow their perennial crops underneath these panels? Makes a lot of sense. The community garden here um, in, in Lawrence it may be possible. Um, <laughs> I suggested to them, you know, well, could you raise up some of those if you're going to have these 50, 50 acre plots that are going to be for research? Couldn't those be a little bit taller like Jack's solar farm? And they said, well, you know, we have to sell this to the Kansas Corporation Commission who are going to be worried about rate increases. And so we've got to be competitive with everybody else. So that was their answer on that. I don't know. We'll see. Um. Yeah, so we're getting now. It's sort of into into opinion time, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, and this is a little wordy, but I thought, you know, I'll just put it out there in praise. So, you know, I don't know much about sheep. Um, it seems to me that that first off, I, I didn't say, and I meant to earlier. I applaud the the Douglas County Commission for having a forward thinking plan to include and insist upon agrivoltaics in anything like this. Um, if we don't do that, then it's we're just going to end up with a bunch of plots that are only going to be, you know, graveled or um, sprayed with Roundup, and that won't be good for anything. So I, I really think it's for our state that's very forward thinking. Um, generally, I'm in, in agreement with this plan. I would like to see some tweaks to it, maybe. It, um, but I think it makes a lot of sense to have this here um, as opposed to out in western Kansas. You know, we're closer to the universities, closer to where people can see it. It's right there by I-70. It can be really a, a show 
piece for Evergy and, and you know the rest of the Southwest Power Pool for this this part of the country. Um, that being said, you know I would like to see you know maybe some taller spots so that you could start doing some things with that really interesting technique of taking advantage of the tilting single axis, you know, for those zones A, B, and C, and, you know, what, what plants would grow here well as cash crops. And um, my second paragraph, I, I really am a believer in no-till organic crop rotation kinds of agriculture. I have a hot link to the Common Ground movie that was aired here in Lawrence. I'm sure a lot of you went here. Terry is in the audience. She did a great show for Eco Radio, interviewing some of the producers of that show. So I'd encourage you to go download that and listen to it if you haven't. Um, I think that's that's the future. We've got to figure out how to start doing agriculture different and sequester some carbon in the process. Just my opinion. Um, so, you know, um, my wife Patty knows a lot about native plants. Um, her friend Courtney, you know, every, everybody knows Courtney. She's been consulted with, uh, people from the biological, you know, survey have been consulted with for the, for the Kansas Sky Project. I think they're really trying to come up with a good plan that everybody likes and, and is, is in agreement on. Um, one thing though, if you're gonna do a, a agrivoltaics as a ecological services to help your beekeepers or whatnot, that's gonna be difficult to do. Um, and, and sustain, in my opinion. I mean, we've been trying to take our little remnant prairie and, and keep it as natural as possible, which we're managing by, you know, prescribed burns, which this picture is. Uh, so without the ability to burn and have other disturbances, um, you're, I think you're going to have a hard time managing native plants. Although I do know that native plants are going to heal the earth just like regenerative agriculture is maybe even more you know i think we need to do whatever we can to promote keeping our prairies and maybe re-establishing them that's what belongs here you know not trees trees sequester carbon but they also go through droughts and get burnt you know and so I, i'm a big believer in prayer so you know and we, we did a tour over in in uh, eudora on a farm and they had a beautiful prairie and a beautiful stone barn and their solar panels were, were on the barn. You know, I think that if you've got rooftop space or if you've got, you know, college campus or high school campus or, a, you know, a, a building or you've got a lot of parking lots, why not cover those things first, you know, before we start using the agricultural land? Those are my opinions. So as far as you folks who are, you know, small scale farmers, I would assume, like me, um, you know, I, I think the thing to do is to do some rooftop solar and then try to convert as much of your equipment as you can from burning gas or diesel, in our case, we've got a little Kubota tractor that burns diesel fuel, you know, to things that use electricity and then put the solar panels on and, and rig it up so you can charge. So, um, this is our equipment shed on the right, and then our barn where we've got a couple of alpacas. So some of you have been out to see us. The next thing I'm gonna do solar wise is to put solar panels on that building and hopefully start replacing our equipment. We've got the Kubota, we've got a ancient gravely zero turn mower that just barely runs. And we've got a little utility vehicle side by side. You know, Those are all gas and diesel. I would like to over time replace them. I noticed that the new equipment dealership that's right there on the way into town by the TP Junction, Heinen, they carry this Electrap brand. So I put this on here. So this is my little dream. That's 25 <laughs> horsepower, you know, uh, tractor, just like our little Kubota. Uh, we're doing a lot of prairie walks now. Patty's managing that with some paths and I think it would be neat to get a hay trailer and be able to pull people through there in the evening on a quiet machine, you know, not the stinky diesel powered thing. So, um, okay, I, that's pretty much my talk. I don't know how I did on time, but uh, thank you. And what, what questions do you have? Yeah, 
I do have one here on the chat. I understand that this project is now controversial with the pylons or footings that go deep into the ground that would disturb the aquifer. Therefore, the locals and farmers are not happy. Do you have an update on that issue? That did not come up in my research. So I did I did do some I did see that there was some concern about the galvanized um, steel pulp. And the galvanized basically means that the steel is dipped in molten zinc. And zinc is an element that we have in our bodies, you know, and I'm not saying that zinc in high concentrations is good for you, but from my little bit of research on that, I don't think that's a big issue. Um, you see now a lot of raised beds that are galvanized, that look like the, you know, the stock tanks, and probably some of you are using those. I think that's more evidence that galvanized is not a big problem. I think if we had more acidic soil, there would be more leaching problems, but we've got real basic soil here. And so, but as far as the aquifer, I know that that's, it's not very far down to water there. I know that, uh, you know, Memorial Stadium, they didn't have an option to, to dig, you know, to make the stadium deeper because of the water. So, you know, I, I could see that might be something. Yes. Well, as far as water, the ground is currently covered in canals. Mm -hmm. And that's where the water which are being moved by um, Roundup, herbicides, uh, pesticides, and synthetic, synthetic fertilizers. You know, so there's already all of that stuff in their water from the way that the land is being farmed now. I agree with that point, you know, and I, I didn't talk about that. And I, I, I hope to not offend anybody if you're the landowners out, out there, but this is, this is bottom land, you know, at one time very fertile, but now let's face it, it's dirt. You know, that's how that's how we farm industrially. We just put a bunch of chemicals on, you know, and feed the soil, but it's just a substrate of dirt. And I think if you did this right 25 years from now, that that thousand acres could be way healthier soil. I really do. Yes. Yeah, I talk. I talked with Brianne Baca. She's the director of the project about that. And because that was one of Byron from Jack's solar farms recommendations that you got to do whatever you can to not compact that soil during construction. And so they've got a plan for having a staging area, you know, and so they're not driving all over everything. And they've got within their plan regulations for how much pressure per square inch. So they'll probably use track vehicles to spread the pressure out. So they are thinking about that for sure. They also won't be driving tractors over it every year, <laughs> several times. Yeah. yeah, the reality is it's probably compacting, you know, really bad right now. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I don't know uh, how many questions, but as far as cost, I know a lot of people are not talking about the potential for the cost to set this up specifically in, in, in any, even a smaller scale. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are as far as bringing this type of technology on a much smaller scale and at a smaller cost so we can see a future where almost every homeowner has some sort of tilting, you know, aspect of, of this that could even be in a suburban setting as opposed to just out on a farm on a larger scale. Right. Yeah. Repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I did get the question totally, but... Yeah, so 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 what are the cost ramifications? And then can we would it make more sense to see if we can't get this more distributed so into everybody's home on the, their rooftops and in their gardens? And if it has to be tilt tilting mechanisms to to go with your little, you know, 50 by 100 garden plot, you know, to make that work better. Yeah, what how couldn't we why can't we do that incentivize that? And what are the costs? I, I agree with that. I think part of the reason why we don't have more um, rooftop solar is because of the way the legislation is written in Kansas, honestly. You know, um, we, we seem to favor utility scale um, green energy, which is better than nothing. But in, in my mind, 
we should all be working towards having these solar panels and having electric vehicles. Because, you know, if you electrify your HVAC, so you get rid of your, your gas powered, um, you know, heating system, and you go with a heat pump. So then in the summertime, it still works the same way, it's electricity. Well, when it's the hottest out, that's when the solar panels work the best. In the winter time, when you don't need to use your tractor, you have a, a big battery sitting there that could be used to help heat your house. And th those kinds of things just make total sense to me. I don't know how we get there. I guess you next. We have a, a, a successful electric system in Boston for the system that they're planning on working with eight foot five. So I guess it's a I don't, but I can't see that it's that much different, honestly. It's it's the matter of steel. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll guarantee you some engineers know that down to the fraction of a cent. And if the farming is between the panels, why do the panels need to be higher? Well, that's a good question too. You know, and I haven't been out to Jack's um, solar garden, but it, you might not have to keep the air too. But yeah, as but far but. As the farm, yeah, and, and and the three zones from that quick video, you know, they're not really using right there under the standard. So I, I don't know. Maybe it does not have to be. But it, it seems like it would be good to have a little flexibility if that makes sense. But, yeah. We put in solar about seven or eight years ago. And when they first came to look at putting it in the house, I had too many pipes coming up the house so they couldn't use the roof yeah and then the other problem is anybody who's got trees around their house mm -hmm. are really restricted in what they can put on their individual house no i i, I hear you I, our house we built it with the idea that it would be solar ready but we had this you know feeble looking elm tree and it just won't die you know and so <laughs> yeah yeah It's great. I mean, let's snap our fingers and have solar panels on everyone's roof right now and in every parking lot. It hasn't happened yet. Because you, of cost and carbon plus what you're talking about. The other thing that you will be told over and over again, it is not enough. I mean, if we are to convert to renewables, we need these huge industrial scale things or it's just going to get hotter and hotter to the point where we can't even go outside in the summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we can sit and talk about it and say, this would be nice, this would be nice. That's why I say it's important to get on the bandwagon with people who have a plan and are making it happen. Yes. And who have the capital. Yes. I will tell you, I have a paneled solar uh, array. And I'm still only getting 96% of my usage out of that. And I'm very efficient. <laughs> and if you look at that same map of Lawrence, it's a tree city. Yeah, I have panels because my roof didn't allow it, and I got trees, so they're out in the backyard. Where you know, as to Margaret's point, it's like, well, we should all have our own little cars rather than have buses. Mm -hmm. No, there's a reason that you go large scale; it's just more efficient, and that's <laughs> and and our fossil fuel industry is spending ads on every Jayhawk game, reminding us we need 28 percent more energy by 2050. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, my school is funded by the coke industry, so. <laughs> yeah. Our businesses and our computers use tons of energy, and that is not going to be supplied by our individual houses. And our, also our, our personal solar panels are all going to be hit by the same no sun. Yeah. What if we have three weeks of no sun? Yeah. We need heavy draw mm -hmm. for everything. And we do not have these big resources 
none of us ever have any interview upon that day. It's something yeah. that we have yeah. relied on. What? Or if there's some other issue that comes up, we have got to have huge backup for, for whatever we've got because our individual are not going to, we don't have big enough batteries. And those batteries are as expensive as putting up the solar array. So if you're spending $30,000 $30, on a solar array that can just barely cover you, or maybe you have to spend $60,000 and $60,000 more for batteries to back you up when we don't have sunlight for three weeks in a row in the winter, or if we have some issue to heat in the summer, Personally, people can't do it. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't because we have done it. We approve of it, but it is not going to solve the situation. Yeah. It's like Margaret said. I'll, we need some I'll, get, I'll get to your question, but let me get on my soapbox a little bit now. You know, I didn't know what to expect here, whether there would be red tribe people here, you know, too, <laughs> but I don't, I don't really see them. But I tend to, I, I want to push back against. The, the red tribe, of course, you know, let's be real. Climate change is really happening, you know, but, yeah. but, but against the blue tribe, we have this idea that we can do a Green New Deal and continue business as usual, just powered by other means. Well, I'm sorry, but it, that's not going to happen. We cannot, we, we cannot keep up the use of the energy that we have now, I think is what a couple of your comments are really getting to. So we've got hard choices to make. Question back there. Yeah, on our place. We do not, Patty and I do not for our property. It, I could see it happening maybe at Casey Farm School before it would happen. Where we, you know, we, Well, mostly because we're not too focused on growing our own vegetables as much as we are growing native plants. And so, um, you know, and, and most of that propagation is done in the greenhouse and in a hoop house to extend the season. And then we just have, uh, I don't know if people have been to our place, but we've got these retail displays that are basically just, you know, 50% shade made with, with cheap slats. So potentially you could do that with solar panels, um, but we have 10 acres and I've got those two buildings out there that would be perfect for solar panels. So that really, practically speaking, that if I do put solar on, they're gonna be just mounted on those roofs, you know, inexpensively. Now, KC Farm School, they, they are very good at getting grants and they've just got 11 acres called Common Ground. It seems to be a popular name. And uh, there, that might be a possibility. So, yeah. I have one more here off the chat. It says, uh, considering the unknown long-term 25 to 50 years sustainability of the agro part of this project, what is the anticipated impact on the cultural and social environment of this area, such as North Lawrence, um, Southern Jefferson County, small towns along US 24? Yeah, I don't really have an answer for okay. that. Yeah, I, I know that the, the ordinance, you know, says about the size, in order to main the, maintain the rural character and preserve agricultural land, the CSECS site area shall be limited to no more than a thousand acres total. No, no, a contiguous thousand acres in a rural setting doesn't, that doesn't seem very rural to me. To be quite honest, I'm not saying it's not a good idea. Terry, you go. Yeah, in all fairness, Greg, aren't there a requirement to get the fewer cities assigned? Oh, sure, sure, sure. You had a question? So, the green team actually has a plan. How that I have a couple of details of the project. So, are who's going to raise the sheep? How is that going to happen? That out for people to well, right, right now, there, there is a, a person, and I, and I did not touch base with her. Her name is Jacqueline Smith, and she is the one that wrote the 20-page grazing plan. She has created a, 
LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, recently called the Caw Valley Grazing and Agrivoltaics Group. You know, and she she's wanting to manage this and bone up. I know her background. I read that she was one of the co-founders of the Green Dirt Farm up by Weston. If any of you have been there, they they have sheep. So I know she has a little bit of experience, but I don't know. Uh, a little, a small, you know, operation with a few head of sheep compared to what what it would take to to really manage the thousand acres with the rotation and shipping them in and out and processing. There's a, there's a lot to work out. Yeah. Yeah. Just just a second. I'll I want to address that. I, you know, another another idea that I kind of floated to to the Brianne and Ashton. Um, it seems like we could get we could divvy it up. You know, to to fam young families that want to live on the land. You know that that could manage the the however you know however they could use agrivoltaics or you know to to make a, an additional profit plus take care of it you know i think that's kind of a management nightmare from their standpoint plus they've got a lot of um sub leasing issues because some of this is leased land from the landowner so that, that makes sense yeah and another point that needs to be emphasized is that right now this prime farmland is not growing food for people at all. They are growing corn for hogs and cattle. Yeah, I, I eat those too. Yeah. And it doesn't go out of production. It just starts producing electricity rather than corn or soybeans. Yeah. And that's in term economically, it's it's still producing a crop, but it's an electrical crop. Have they tried um, any other? Because in in the uh, thing they were basically growing vegetables. Have they tried any other types of crops uh, mm -hmm. with agrivolta? Um, it's been what I've heard is peppers and tomatoes, and it's it's been more in the in the arid places. Um, I don't know what we grow here. That's a very good question. Not necessarily off the topic, but different production wise. Isn't this in the floodplain? If it's in the floodplain, it will never be used for building houses. Yeah. So if it's in the floodplain, this is it's either going to be farming, which may be productive in years of flood, but probably not. Mm -hmm. And then also then what do you do with sheep in the flood? Yeah. <laughs> so, there are there are houses right around it. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Yes. There are portable options. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's that that's my experience with solar. It's just little ones that you can get, you know, from Harbor Freight or you know, inexpensively. And I we put in two cisterns so we catch the water off our house. And I've got a little $90 12 volt solar pump that, that can run and it, it runs basically just like a garden hose. And that's very, very much something that you could do. I'm also, you know, we have a lot of battery powered um, trimmers and and I have a little battery powered push mower. And I don't know if, if, if you haven't used a battery powered chainsaw, get one of those because it's a much more pleasant experience. Than you used to get. But what what I haven't seen, and I, I, I have the Ryobi brand, not to advertise for Home Depot, 
But I'm surprised that they don't have a Ryobi solar powered charger station. You know, that, that's I haven't I haven't made that happen yet, but I want to do that. I want to start putting the electrons into those little batteries with the sun. So yeah, all great.